I know I said I wasn't going to tear down two similar engines back to back, but a good friend of mine needs a passenger side cylinder head from this. So I'm going to take apart this 2UZ FE. This is a non-VVT 4.7 liter V8 found in 2000 to 2004 Sequoia and Tundra and 98 to 02 Land Cruiser and Lexus LX470. And unlike almost every other core that I've had in here, I have a story. I have a story. This is from a 2000 Lexus LX470 that I bought at a tow lot. It came in with no key, didn't know if it ran, and a lot of times I'll buy new keys. I have a key programmer and I can probably do a video on that at some point. But before I buy keys and go through all that trouble, I usually do a compression test. And I did a compression test on this engine and it has two low cylinders. And when I say low, I'm not talking like 10% low, I'm talking like 60% low. Definitely a problem. And yes, it could be carboned up rings and it might have been fine if it was installed in the vehicle, but that's not the way I work. I don't want to waste someone's labor installing an engine that might be fine. I like to know that it's fine or we're going to take it completely apart in the case of this engine. It has 200,000 miles on it. Um, it is fully dressed. My guys pulled it out of the truck, put it on a crate, and then put it on a stand today for me to take it apart. So we're going to find out why this engine has low compression and hopefully get a passenger side cylinder head out of it for my friend. Before we get to turning wrenches, I wanted to talk about part value. I get lots of questions and comments and people sending me emails of what parts are worth from these engines. And it's, it's really not something I do on most of my teardowns, but I'm going to talk about it with this one. So this is a non-VVT engine and there's not a lot of money on it. Now this truck parted out very well. I've made plenty of money on it. So anything that I can sell off of this engine is strictly profit. I, don't, I didn't pay for this engine essentially. So there's only a couple parts that are worth good money. And when I say good money, stuff that sells repeatedly, that's easy to sell and doesn't sit on my shelf for months. The throttle body, I've sold tons of these, probably a couple hundred of them. That's an easy 150 bucks. And the wire harness, my guys did a very good job pulling this engine. They didn't cut the harness. This harness is probably worth another $250 or $300. And then the cylinder heads have a little bit of value, but again, this engine had low compression. So we'll see if they actually are good or not. And the rest of it is pretty much scrap or shelf fodder. I hate to say that, but these engines are pretty good. If you keep oil in them, if you keep coolant in them, and you keep a timing belt on them, they will last forever. First things first, you guys know the drill. It's time to get the plugs out and see what they look like. Well, this looks like the nicest set of plugs I've pulled out of a core engine in quite some time. This is a rather recent set of Denso Iridiums. I don't see any signs of uh, engine set gap. Everything is in good shape, no foul play in the combustion chamber. Now, a couple of them are a little dark. Uh, maybe it was burning some oil, might have some ring issues, but nothing to be alarmed at yet. Before I start ripping parts off this engine, I'd like to address a question I get on almost every single teardown, and that is what do I do with the hardware? The nuts and the bolts and the little brackets all of that stuff does not end up in the scrap bin. I mean, head bolts end up in the scrap bin, a lot of rusty and in bad shape bolts, that all ends up scrapped. However, I usually save bolts, especially from like Toyota engines and Honda engines and BMW engines, things that I own, things that I would repair, things I like having around the shop. Uh, I have buckets of Honda bolts, buckets of Toyota bolts, buckets of BMW bolts. I have all that stuff at home or some of it's up here, up here as well, depending on what I need to work on. Uh, but it, it doesn't get wasted, it doesn't get scrapped, and maybe at some point I'll start selling that stuff. I'm sure there's a market for it. The first thing I'm going to do is remove the throttle body, uh, get that out of the way. That's pretty easy. This is the only thing that ever goes wrong with these that I see in pulling them, and that is the cable will get stuck in the plastic. So I'm going to like let that sit for a while so I don't break it, and we'll get the throttle body off that way. Uh, that wasn't any good. And yes, I cut rubber hoses. You should always replace these with new ones anyway. Oh, it's leaking. Mm. 
not cool. Let's go ahead and pull this belt off. Now I'm gonna spend some time pulling the rolling accessories off this engine, kinda of get some of the peripheral parts. Now I'm gonna spend some time and pull the rolling accessories like the AC compressor, alternator power steering pump, get some of the outside parts off of this engine to kinda of clean it up so we can see what we're working with. Next, I'm going to start pulling this engine harness and we're gonna see how many connectors I break. These get a little fragile with heat and age. It just, oh, there's one. Not off to a good start. Not off to one at all. Oh, so many places. Now there's one side. Success. Now it's time to pull the intake manifold to reveal one of the things I don't like about this engine. No! <sighs> I dropped my 12 in the valley, a valley of sockets, valley of my socket. Let's see if I can fish that thing out. Hopefully I don't lose my extension too. I can almost reach it. Come back. It's gone forever. Time for another 12. That's two 12s. There's 24 millimeters of socket in the valley now. It's no 10 millimeters, so I got plenty of 12s for this thing. Took 36 millimeters of socket to get this intake off. It's ridiculous. Probably need a better extension. I think that's what you guys are telling me right now. Well, there's one. There we are. Okay, all the sockets retrieved. Now we'll show you what I don't like. And this, ladies and gentlemen, is my least favorite part of this engine, and that is the starter location. They put it in the hottest part of the engine, in the middle of the V. It's also relatively inaccessible. You have to pull the intake manifold. You have to buy new intake gaskets. Well, I would buy new intake gaskets if you're going to do this job. And the bolts look like the least fun part of the job entirely. They look very inaccessible. I don't know if you get to them from the top or the bottom. I must admit, I've never done one of these in the truck, so I don't know how bad it actually is. However, it could be a situation where the starter never goes bad. Maybe I'm just crying over well done steak. Well, the intake ports all look really good. This is why port injection rules. They're always clean, not covered in carbon. They all look nice. I don't see any signs of issues with this head yet. So that's good. Now let's get the heat shields and the exhaust manifolds off. Oh. Well, 
Well, it looks like that 10 just turned itself into a 3 8. Let's see if we can get it off without. Oh, yes. Crisis averted. All right, let's fire these exhaust manifold bolts out. Go ahead and get the driver's side valve cover off. Well, it's pretty dirty. It doesn't look like it's been very well taken care of. Not terrible. I've seen much worse. There's not like huge oil deposits everywhere. It's just pretty well varnished. Cams look good, at least the lobes do. I don't think there's any water or moisture in here. So let's go on to the other side. Same story on this side, no major deposits. It's just pretty varnished. I don't see any signs of debris. The next thing I'm going to do is cut a hole in this hose to drain whatever coolant. This is like the lowest access point I can see on the cooling system, so I'm gonna cut this so that we can get this water manifold off the engine. Ow! Well, that was great. See, the idea behind this was to not make a mess, you know, when I pull all these parts off. So instead, I'm just gonna make a mess when I cut this hose. Let's go ahead and get this crossover pipe off. Well, let's get this tensioner out of the way. Looks like this is replaced. Nope, that's just gonna stay there for right now. See, I get these ideas. Sweet, this still has a whole bunch of coolant in it. Now I have a whole bunch of coolant on me. All this is draining, let's get these timing covers off. The belt looks like it's in pretty good shape. There's that tensioner and the other, the center cover. Oh, it's definitely had a water pump put in it. Let's get the other timing cover. Next, we're gonna get the fan pulley bracket off. Man, I'm just dropping everything today. Now let's get this lower timing cover off. So someone has done a timing belt kit pretty recently. The belt looks good. All of these have been replaced. It's got a Gates water pump on it. It's probably a Gates timing belt kit. So it looks like this engine at least had some maintenance done. That's a good sign. Let's go ahead and peel this belt off. And uh, yeah, then we'll start getting the heads off. I'm actually going to put this engine in time before I pull the belt. Might make things a little bit easier. I'm not sure. It might be totally unnecessary. All the timing marks seem to line up. Get this pump out of here. First, I'm going to take this coolant line off the top. All right, I'm just going to give it a little, little tap. Oh, we're leaking. We are leaking. This engine holds a lot of coolant, apparently.
And there's the water pump, which looks like a pair of, like a couple of, oh, I'm not gonna say it. You guys already know, it's a water pump thing. Looks like two water pump things. Next, I'm going to pull the rear coolant crossover. Yeah, this is really corroded in here. Wow, that was really stuck in there. That's pretty terrible. I can't imagine doing that in a truck. Next, I'm going to pull the cam gears off. That allows access to these tens, which are necessary to take the heads apart. Now I'm going to pull those metal plates. The next thing I'm going to do is pull this cam cap here. This is what holds the cam seal in. And this too gets a little tap. Seems like that gigantic seal is holding this in place. We're going to give that seal a little tap with this center punch. See if we can kind of break the seal with that. There we are. I've got the cam seal out, and now we're going to go ahead and crack all these cam caps loose. We're going to crack them loose and then zip them out, and then we got to pull the cams out at the same time because these cams are driven off of one cam gear. The intake cam drives the exhaust cam. It's important I keep the cam caps in order. Right. Now I gotta pull these out at the same time. Or not. Yeah, they came right out. Well, all the cam journals look really nice. I don't see any signs of oil starvation. The cams also look really nice. The cams themselves look really nice as well. I don't see any damage whatsoever. Now it's time to fire the head bolts out and pull the cylinder head. I can hear that head backing off the block, it's crazy. This for sure is gonna leak coolant. There is no way this is not gonna leak coolant. Oh yeah. Eh, I didn't need that. Eh, that's not too bad. Head gasket looks Dirty, but all right. Just dirty from all the corrosion that fell into it. The head looks pretty good. I don't see any damage to the valves. No indicators as to why it had low compression, at least on the cylinder head side. But since my friend needs this head, I'm going to go ahead and prep this head, get some of the unnecessary stuff off of it, get the HLAs out of it, and then throw it in the parts washer so you guys can see the difference between a dirty head and a clean head. This is our parts washer. I've got the cylinder head in it. It's warmed up. It's been on for a couple hours now. And uh, this uses kind of a caustic mixture. And I know some of you are gonna say, well, caustic dissolves aluminum. And you're right, if I would to leave it in there for a very long time, it would cause some damage. But most machine shops use this kind of mixture. Uh, again, I only run this for 30 to 45 minutes, maybe an hour on something really dirty, not long enough to uh, cause any damage. And then it gets rinsed immediately after. So I'm gonna set it and hopefully not forget it. Well, I think I found a low compression culprit. Look at this rust here in the cylinder. And I, I, I kind of suspected that this car sat for a couple of years and perhaps uh, some moisture somehow got into the engine. I didn't see any signs of, you know, water in the intake. I didn't see any signs that it was like an external source and I don't think it was overheated and this is why there's rust here. I think this was literally condensation. It's pretty humid here in the Midwest. And then sometimes in the right situation, an engine sitting 
Uh, it can cause some rust in the cylinders after a while, and maybe that's why we saw low compression. All right, we're going to go ahead and pull this cap off and probably have to work with that seal again like the other side. Same deal like last time, I'm going to crack these loose and then zip them out and pull the cams. This head looks the same. There's no damage to any of the journals. The cams look the same. So I, I don't think this had any kind of oiling issue. I put the cam caps back on in order so I don't lose them or put them in the wrong order. Now let's go ahead and get the head off. Well, same side, same story as the other side. I am honestly surprised that I only had two cylinders with low compression. And look at those cylinder walls. They are rather rusty. And sure, most of that would clean up after it ran, but I don't think it would ever run as well as it should. And the head looks pretty good, just like the other side. No valve damage, no signs of debris. I think this is a good pair of heads off of this engine. I think they want you to take the oil filter housing off to take the oil pump off, but we're not going to do that. Well, let's give this pump a little tap. All right, time to make a mess. Now I'm pretty sure, pretty sure it's most of the way drained. Which that doesn't really mean anything at all. Like, not even a little. Mm, that was a little bit. A little bit more. Oh, now it's just messing with me now. Oh, there's all kinds of oil in here. Let's see if we get any oil out of it. Yep. Go ahead and pull the bolts out of the lower pan. Oh, let's just give it a little whoopsies. Pretty dirty in there. But there's nothing silvery or metallic. Again, I didn't really think this had an oiling issue in the first place. The pickup has a couple, a little bit of debris in there. Not really, it's just really gnarly looking oil, really sludgy oil. And what's interesting is I can see signs of moisture, little bits of moisture in here. So I wonder if this had some water, if this drove into water. I didn't see any, you know, we didn't see any signs of water on the top of the valves, and that's usually the, the first indicator. Go ahead and pull this baffle out of the way. Everything in here just looks dirty. I don't see any anything that's actually like wrecked or coming apart. So let's go ahead and pull this upper pan. Just a whole bunch of 12 millimeter bolts. See if they give you a place to pry. Oh yes, they do. upper pan. So you know how I'm used to the UR series of engines where there's just an o-ring on the pickup to the oil pump. Well this is bolted which is why why I couldn't get the oil pump off. I would have figured it out eventually. Ah, look how easy that came off. And there we go. One oil pump. Get this pickup out of the way. Let's see how this feels turning over here. So this is a little tighter than I'd like and I think that's because of that rust on the cylinder walls. Eventually if I do this enough I'm sure it'll clean a good portion of that out. But the good news is I won't have anywhere near the trouble getting the rods and pistons out that I did on that 3UR. Let's go ahead and start in front of the motor and work our way back and get the rods and pistons out of this engine.
bearings are in nearly perfect condition. They look fantastic for 200 plus thousand miles. Here is the low compression culprit. Look out, look at how rusty these rings are. Pretty terrible. This car definitely sat with some moisture somewhere near it or near moisture. And this thing, the plates expired in 19 when I got it. So that means it's probably sat since 18 or 19. So at least two years. Last and least, let's go ahead and take the main cap bolts out and get the crank out. The main bearings look fantastic. Just like you'd want to see. And as you would expect, the crank also looks very good. Not sure what it's worth. I've never, never had any calls or demand for them, but we'll, we'll try to sell this one. I hate to throw a good crank away. Fries are done. That is one hot cylinder head. I'm just doing this to kind of cool it off so I can grab it and clean it how I like to clean them. Cool enough to grab. Oh, it's still hot. Oh, hot, hot. Oh, so hot. So hot. So hot. Here is the finished product. Of course, this should still be checked for straightness, make sure the valves seal very well, but I don't see any apparent cracks. I don't think this thing was overheated. The combustion chambers all look pretty good. This thing cleaned up very nice. Look how much nicer that looks. That parts washer is worth its weight. I've had that thing for a couple years now and I cannot even explain to you how many labor hours that thing has saved me. It's, it's wild. I sh I'm actually thinking about buying a second one. I'm actually really surprised right now, and not because that engine was super easy to take apart or difficult, but that engine only had two cylinders with low compression. I mean, how? How, how is that possible? You guys all saw the cylinder walls. Six cylinder walls were completely rusty. You guys saw the rings. I mean, those weren't even rings anymore. Those were rust circlips. How did it only have two low cylinders? And this is exactly why I do compression and leak down tests on every engine I can't hear run. And I do that before I do anything else, before I try to program keys, before I buy keys for it. It's, it's a waste to do all that stuff on a bad engine. And I, I, I don't like to sell engines and waste people's time. I don't like to just shoot from the hip and hope it's good. I mean, this thing was probably good when it was parked. It probably ran when parked, which God, I hate that adage so much. It doesn't matter. That thing probably did run when parked. I mean, someone went through the effort of putting a new timing belt and water pump on it, and that's like a four or five hour job plus parts. So it was maintained, but it likely just sat somewhere in a very humid environment, and it didn't turn over in a long period of time. Two or three years probably allowed condensation to form on the cylinder walls, and well, that did the motor in. Now the UZ family of engines is my favorite Toyota family of engines bar none. I mean, I know two J's and the JZ series is great, but the UZ is a fantastically designed family of engines. I mean, not too keen on the starter placement, but the rest of that engine is super robust, especially the non VVT versions. Um, I, I love those engines and I'm sure some of you guys with those trucks with 400, 500,000 miles can attest to it. Those engines will run as long as you keep oil in them. They don't really have any major failure points. If you'd like to buy parts from this engine or any of the other engines I've torn down, I'm going to leave our email in the video description. And as always, I love all the comments, all the criticism and the feedback. I love it all. And I'll catch you on the next one.